Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope everyone's having a great day. We are joined today with Andy Black, who is the president of the Association of Oil Pipelines. Good morning. How are you doing today, Andy? Good morning, Jessica. Great to be here. Oh, it's hopefully going to be a wonderful day. So I guess let's go ahead and start with a little bit about the Association of Oil Pipelines. What is it exactly that the association is responsible for? We're a small trade association in Washington, D.C., and we represent uh, pipelines, liquid pipelines that carry crude oil, uh, refined products like gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel, and then natural gas liquids. Uh, We are uh, focused primarily on federal issues, but sometimes get involved out there in the states, and it's good to be able to talk to you about pipelines. Absolutely. I find it interesting, uh, especially when looking at your website, I see that there's a whole bunch of of, uh, space on the website dedicated to the safety measures that are taken with the pipelines. And I find it interesting that it that these types of measures aren't actually talked about more, I don't know, in in, uh, mainstream media or just in open dialogue when it comes to oil and gas industry. We do need to talk about safety a lot. Uh, AOPL does three things primarily. We advocate for responsible public policies, so with our safety regulators and Congress, uh, and we next, like you're talking about, work on improving safety for pipelines, continuous improvement in safety. And then third is communicating to the public about the role that pipelines play in their daily lives, how they're the safest mode of transportation. And as you mentioned, that's something you can never do enough of. We really want people to be comfortable uh, with the fact that we rely on pipelines every day uh, and that they're uh, safe and getting safer. Right. Well, and there's, there's what, over 200,000 pipelines. Is that just in the U.S.? Yes, over 200,000 in the uh, Uh, miles of hazardous liquid pipelines in the U.S., and that's been growing. That's stopping a little bit right now with COVID, but it'll pick up later. The pipelines are all around. People don't normally notice them, but they're there serving us. Right. Well, that's that's a lot of pipelines to be monitoring and keeping safe. How do you monitor the pipelines? Uh, Pipelines are uh, monitored in control rooms with operators, Uh, working 24-7, collecting information from up and down the pipe, Uh, indications about pressure and flow rate. They're looking for signs of an incident, but almost every pipeline that's out there is, is run by a control room. And that became an issue in COVID, making sure that those control room workers were protected from the virus, from other employees, and could keep working while everybody was shutting down. Were you able to keep working through that period of time? or Yeah, no pipelines shut down because of COVID. Uh, pipe, uh, control room operators were uh, sequestered from other employees. There, I even heard stories of, of hotel rooms away from families where control room personnel would go. And all you did was go from the hotel to uh, the control room and back. Uh, pipelines are sometimes shut down during uh, hurricanes or natural disasters just to make sure that there's not going to be an incident. But we kept operating during COVID and uh, kept doing the maintenance that we needed to do with field personnel. While most of the employees worked from home, those are people who couldn't uh, work from home and had to be out there uh, doing their thing, and uh, they were largely protected from the virus. So it's a success story. That is a success story. Have things been kind of evening out, I suppose, since then? It's better. Uh, like much of American business, there was a, there was a downturn. There was a period where uh, first uh, use of gasoline, and diesel fuel, and jet fuel dropped off. Uh, they've come back a little bit, jet fuel the least. Uh, and then Uh, Once the refineries recognized that there wasn't as much demand for refined products, they started slowing down. So you had periods of less throughput, what we call in the pipeline industry, of the amount of product that moves through the pipelines. So that was logistics issues for people to manage to make sure that storage tanks didn't fill up and that everything kept operating safely while we're providing the the diesel that we need for freight to keep moving when everyone was ordering things at home. Uh, And then business issues, Uh, less revenue as business for pipelines. A lot of that has come back. Uh, 
Uh, jet fuel was down 80% as a country at the worst. Wow. Now it's down 50%. And that is so our, our customers in the airline business continue to suffer. Uh, diesel fuel, gasoline, they're down still about 10% from where they were. So we're coming back. Uh, what we need is what everybody needs. We need the virus to be under control and vaccines to be out there so that every American feels comfortable doing what she or he was doing beforehand. And, and then this ought to take care of itself. Well, I certainly hope that will be correct. I certainly do. So what do you think the, the biggest obstacle aside from COVID has been over this last year? Well, uh, for the pipeline industry, it started with a price war between Saudi Arabia and Russia that was already affecting the business. And to me, COVID is two things, and they're, they're both big. That was the, the health issue uh, and then the business issue. So one of the lasting impacts of, kind of the business issue is uh, deferred projects. This is a sector that has been growing because Americans have been needing more of the products that pipelines carry. And you've got some projects that were either canceled or, or put on hold. Uh, and companies, when you listen to what they tell investors, say that uh, they want to be back in, say, 2022 with projects, but they're, they're not going to be uh, doing those when uh, there's less need for our products. So there's, there's people that we'd like to get back to work when the economy recovers in the pipeline sector and in oil and gas generally. Uh, then on the public health issues, one of our challenges was just doing that type of advocacy that we do in a time where we're working from home, but also government is. And uh, it was interesting to see government leaders uh, starting to do calls and Zoom calls instead of meetings. Uh, it took everybody a while to get back up to doing regular business uh, over uh, advocating over a computer screen than in person. Uh, but that's something that everybody's gotten used to now, both in oil pipelines and in advocacy. And I think lots of other places in American life, like you and I, we could have been doing this in a studio together and now we're doing it over the phone. Right, right. It would have been nice to have met you in person, but. Likewise. Um, so the projects that ended up being deferred, that's kind of what you're looking into for 2021 is kind of getting everything back up and on schedule. Yeah, there's going to be a time where we uh, need more pipeline capacity to serve uh, Americans, right? Everybody uses the products that pipelines carry, whether that's uh, diesel fuel for freight uh, to give you your packages or gasoline for getting where you need to go or jet fuel when we're all taking flights again. Uh, we also move the products that get turned by uh, manufacturing facilities into things like like PPE. Uh, when that happens again, we need to be ready to for uh, policymakers to say yes to pipelines and for the public to recognize uh, that a, a pipeline coming in is a good thing when it's operating safely. It can create jobs and tax revenue and make sure that we don't have shortages of energy. So we, we, we shouldn't let up on that explanation to the American public about why we need more pipelines and and that they're operating safely, because we'll get to that point, and we need to be ready. Right. Well, and that, what that pops into my head is something that I've been seeing for quite a while, um, is that, like you had said earlier, pipelines, well, they are the cleanest way of transporting liquid oil and gas and diesel and yeah, there's two ways we look at it now. First, the traditional way is uh, spills, is incidents, and there's even decimal points above that 99.999% of every product in a pipeline is delivered safely. So uh, it's it's the Americans' benefits that a barrel of crude oil move on a pipeline over a train or a truck or a barge. I'm not saying those are unsafe. They're just statistically not as safe as pipelines. So then the other way that we look at it now as there's concern about climate change is that uh, pipeline transportation has lowest lower carbon emissions than any other mode of transportation. So if you're concerned about fuels moving from point A to point B with the fewer carbon emissions, 
Uh, even the Obama administration made clear that the pipeline is the least carbon emissions way to do it. Yeah, see, and I, I find that to be highly intriguing, especially with the, well, the controversy over oil and gas over this last year as different groups have, well, it seemed like at the beginning of the year, we're especially pushing hard to try and uh, get rid of pipelines, lessen the amount of, of pipelines that were being utilized for oil and gas. Yeah, um, Americans want action on climate change, but they don't want policies that increase the cost of their energy or uh, create shortages that make them not be able to uh, get where they need to go. So our job as pipeline operators is to uh, to help deliver the energy that they need while this energy transition is worked on, and they're going to need pipelines for a long time. Uh, we uh, we use electricity primarily to power the pumps of oil pipelines. So we've got an incentive to use less electricity and to have lower carbon emissions. And uh, that itself will help uh, make sure that the lowest carbon emitting mode continues to get cleaner. Nice. So with the uh, incoming administration here within this next week, do you think that the the new players in the White House and, and on that team are going to change any part of the way that the pipelines are, I want to say, administered is not the correct word, are implemented? Maybe change the way that things are implemented for pipelines? Well, it, it could be, right? This is... Uh, not a group that has been talking as positively about pipelines uh, as say, the transition, the administration that is leaving. But there are there are great opportunities to work with them. Uh, pipeline safety is not a partisan issue. We just had a success in Congress in December with doing a, a pipeline safety law that's supported by uh, by both parties and both the House and the Senate. Uh, we're ready to talk to them about uh, any concerns that they've got. We feel confident that the more that is understood about the safety of pipelines or of pipeline construction, the more we should be able to address concerns. Uh, pipeline permitting is going to be important when the economy is back up and people are needing uh, more pipeline capacity. So we want pipeline permitting decisions to be to be fair, to be on the merits, uh, not sensational, not about myths, but on facts. And then we want those to, to stand up. We need any American business, like a pipeline operator, to know that once they've got a permit, uh, they can do the investment, create the jobs to uh, provide customer service. We've got a lot of advocacy to do. Sounds like it also sounds like a pretty good way to start the year, though, if uh, if just in December you'd gotten that passed with bipartisan support to have both parties agree on something, I think is a success story. So what a, that's kind of a good beginning to things, even if even if there's a little uncertainty, it sounds like. Right. We're excited about that law. It creates a couple of things that we think will help. Uh, one, uh, there's a program that our safety regulator in the Department of Transportation can use now to pilot test new technologies and new safety techniques to gain information uh, so that uh, they can decide how to roll out safety technologies and techniques across the whole pipeline industry. Uh, just like in so many other sectors, technology is changing rapidly in pipeline safety. The data that comes from an inspection device traveling inside a pipeline collects a lot of information and the people back uh, in the computers can gain a lot of information from that. And we want the pace of technology to be matched by government regulations keeping up with that. So now Congress said, Department of Transportation, go lean into technological developments and learn from them, learn what can be safely applied across, uh, across the whole pipeline industry. So we're glad that uh, Congress listened on that, and that's something that we can uh, work with the next administration on. Wonderful. That does sound very exciting. Real real quick, because you, you piqued my interest, you were talking about a device on the inside of the pipeline that uh, relays data I'm, back. I'm glad you asked about that. Uh, 
you may have heard or your listeners of the uh, kind of the phrase of a smart pig. Uh, there is technology that is put inside a pipeline that's pressed through the pipeline that gathers information. So uh, they once you uh, bring out a pipeline, bring sorry, bring a smart pig out of a pipeline, you've got information about uh, any deformities on the inside of a pipe. The goal is to uh, learn about issues on a pipeline and review them and address them if necessary before they would become a problem. So this is all like preventative maintenance, uh, and it's using technology that you might find at a doctor's office when you get an MRI or an X-ray. Uh, these engineers can take information from a smart pig traveling inside a pipeline and, and learn about uh, a feature that they might need to go uncover and inspect personally. And that's that's driven a lot of safety improvements over the last several decades and even over the last five years. Over the last five years, incidents that impact public or the environment, they're down 36%, even from a good where place that they started. This is one of the ways that we're excited about continuing to improve pipeline safety. Wow, that is that's pretty incredible. Very proactive. Well, a lot of work. Uh, you you, uh, you see a pipeline marker, uh, and you don't know that there's a lot of technology uh, that's going through the pipeline underground to try to make things safer. Uh, we need to do that. Our goal is zero incidents. Uh, even if we're at 99.999 plus percent, we want to be at 100. And the American people expects that, that the pipeline is always going to be able to retain the product that's inside it. Yeah, that's a that's that's a very good quality of standard to, to hold. And that's very, very impressive. You must have a lot of very brilliant people working on these these technologies. I, I'm impressed by what they uh, what they can do. Absolutely. Well, is there anything else that you might like to discuss or think that would be noteworthy for anyone listening going on into the new year? I think we've covered a lot of ground here. I want to make sure that uh, people understand that uh, pipeline industry is there to work with them. If they've got a, a pipeline in their neighborhood or if there's one that's being proposed, uh, that we can help answer questions and that they that they depend on them right now. Only in a hurricane, uh, when a pipeline is down uh, and product is not being delivered, do people really recognize sometimes how much we need them, right? The, the gasoline at the gas station uh, comes there after a long trip in several pipelines. Uh, we want people to be comfortable with pipelines uh, and how that they are maintained. And if you've got a pipeline operator in your area and you've got questions about how to act safely around a pipeline and call before you dig, uh, we want them to reach out. And we're ready to help. Asking questions is a good thing. Knowledge is power, as Sir Francis Bacon said. Yep. I agree. Well said. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today, Andy. I really appreciate it. Great, Janica. Great questions. Thank you. All right, friends and listeners, that was Andy Black, president and CEO for the Association of Oil Pipelines. I want to thank him again for taking time out of his day to talk with me and so that we could get this great information out to anyone who is interested in taking a listen to it. If you like what you've heard, if you want to find out more information, a couple of great resources to check out would be AOPL.org. That would be the website for the Association of Oil Pipelines. You can go to AOPL.org. Dot org or if you want to find out about pipelines specifically go to pipeline 101. Dot org. That was pipeline101.org. And of course, if you want to find even more great content, go ahead and take a look at what the rest of crudelife.com has to offer. 